Earlier this year, an era ended where NASA put its shuttle program into mothballs. It gave the space agency pause to reflect on its many achievements, with the obvious highlight being the moon landing in 1969. But before the launch of Apollo 11 came years of planning and research, including work by South Australian scientists who recently marked the 45th anniversary of an ambitious program to map the moon. Mike Sexton reports. Off the Stewart Highway on the outskirts of Woomera, a deserted road leads to the edge of a salt lake named Island Lagoon. From a distance it looked rather beautiful. It looked like uh, you were at the seaside, but when you got close to the edge of the lake it was anything but wet. On the lake's edge are the ruins of another era, when this was home to cutting-edge technology. The first deep space tracking station built outside of the United States, a place where radio signals could be sent to and received from the edges of the solar system. Don Gray was the senior engineer here in the mid-1960s when NASA made contact, asking for help with its bold mission to land men on the moon. They wanted a lunar exploration program as a preliminary to the Apollo program mapping possible landing sites. Engineers of the Boeing Company and the National Aeronautics and Space Administration are making final preparations to launch one of a series of lunar orbiters. The satellite's primary mission is to photograph landing areas on the moon for America's astronauts. The lunar orbiters were satellites designed to measure such things as the radiation levels and gravitational pull that might be experienced by the astronauts. But they were also looking for a landing site, and so they photographed 99% of the lunar surface. One lens will cover an area of 25 square miles and record objects as small as a card table. The other will make overlapping photographs of 440 square mile sections. During its mission, the lunar orbiter will take 160 pairs of pictures while filming 12,000 square miles. Because the lunar orbiters couldn't be brought back to Earth, NASA had to figure out a way of getting the images from space. So they built a mobile lab, not much bigger than a watermelon, where the film was processed, scanned, converted to a radio signal and transmitted back to Earth, which is where Island Lagoon came into things. At Goldstone, Near an abandoned gold mine in California's Mojave Desert, this 85-foot diameter antenna is the communication link with the lunar orbiter. It's similar to two other antennas in Australia and Spain. There was a special room of equipment put in for processing the lunar orbiter data. Uh, the tracking station was responsible for all of the tracking and then for transmitting that data back over to America. Incoming photographic information from the orbiter is fed into this equipment where electronic wizardry converts the electronic signal to a pinpoint of light of varying intensity. The tiny beam sweeps back and forth, exposing a moving strip of 35 millimeter film. Those strips of 35 millimeter film were then reassembled, an estimated 18 miles of it eventually, to create what, at the time, were stunning images of the moon's surface. The Earth had never been seen from the lunar distances before, and uh, Lunar Orbiter 1 sent back a picture of the Earth rise. It wasn't like the ones from Apollo, of course. It was um, uh, black and white, and uh, it was very coarse. But it showed the Earth floating in, in space, and that's about the first time that the humans on Earth realised that uh, <laughs> how small we are in the, uh, in, the, in the universe. After the photography was finished, the lunar orbiters remained in space and continued the connection with Australia. The Island Lagoon tracking station was superseded by radio telescopes at Parks in New South Wales and near Canberra, which were being prepared to help with the attempt to go to the moon. We needed something, to, some practice before we did the Apollo missions, so we used to use Lunar Orbiter a lot uh, to set up our antenna, adjust it and do all the adjustments and practice um, lunar tracking. And Lunar Orbiter is very, very important for that. After years of planning and research, the manned space moon flight took off in 1969, and everyone knows how well that went.
There's yeah. three astronaut signatures. Me. <laughs> the Apollo 11 astronauts honoured the role played by the Australians with letters of thanks. But 45 years after the original Atlas of the Moon was created, the images have been revived. A group in California first saved the tapes, then rebuilt the old tape machines. Once that was done, they had to get the miles of tape in order, something they were able to do by listening to an unmistakable accent at the start of each tape. <coughs> this is Station 41 one we're recording video data from Lunar Orbit Spacecraft number 05. This is the beginning of tape reel number 2. The date is 30th November 1966. The painstaking work ended with the shots from the Lunar Orbiter, including the famous Earthrise, clearer now than in 1966. I'm sure the uh, astronauts would have loved to have had the definition that's available on that data now, but, uh, but nevertheless, the main thing was to achieve their mission objectives. And if our pictures were good enough for them to do it, then that made us very proud of the part we played. All that remains of Island Lagoon tracking station now is a few old foundations. What lives on are the memories of those who worked there and the images they helped bring back from space. They were great days to live in and right through uh, all of the planetary exploration, the moon exploration, the manned flight programs, I was fortunate enough to work on them. Uh, lived through some of the greatest days of men's achievement and of technological advances that have been seen on this earth. Such exciting times. Mark Sexton reporting.